Okay, so now it's uh, time for our, our very exciting panel discussion. Uh, so all the speakers uh, who, have, um, who have spoken till now, they, they will take part uh, in, this, uh, in this panel discussion and this is a chance for you to ask them any questions that you have uh, overall about this collaboration models or all this, uh, uh, this working modes that we have mentioned. And for our panel discussion, I would also like to uh, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Guillaume Obozinski. Uh, Guillaume is a deputy uh, chief data scientist at the Swiss Data Science Center. He graduated with a PhD in statistics from UC Berkeley in 2009 and he did his postdoc and held until 2012 a research position in the Villo and Sierra teams at INRIA and Ecole Normale Supreme in Paris. Welcome, Guillaume. Basically, the speakers had to bring their own chairs. <laughs> so, so guys, please bear with us. We are in the final lap of this session uh, of this long marathon of academic uh, support and scientific services in AI. And it's also the last session, I mean, the last lap of uh, this conference. So we are really thankful that you stay. It will be an interesting discussion <laughs> do we do we does it work out uh, pl please be careful and don't fall down from the from the stage please Okay, first of all, thanks again for all these inspiring, insightful talks this afternoon. My very first question that I have to you is uh, more uh, like a survey question. You can raise your hands. So, do you con the question is this, do you consider yourself as a researcher or as a service provider, as nothing of those or as both? Who, is a Who thinks he's a researcher? Who thinks, uh, who thinks he's a service or she is a service provider? Both. Nothing of it. Something else. What do you consider yourself? Just supporting science, which is kind of like. Yeah, I guess what we do is just supporting science in general. So it's kind of like between being researchers and. Because I mean, like, what, you, what was the other definition? Just service provider? Service provider or researcher? Yeah, I guess it's, it sounds like too much. Um, they come to you and say, please do that and this, and you do it, and they, they run away. And I see this overall uh, as more like, okay, we now discuss together. This is what you think you need. This is thing, what I think you need, and then you find a solution. So I would say it's something like between being a researcher, because you still think a lot, and, so, and so, uh, providing them a support, which is like just providing them something. I'm not sure, but. Okay. Yes, please hand the mics like this. Right, thank you. Um, of course, uh, one has to ask these uh, provocative questions, but uh, in an ideal situation, basically, that question shouldn't arise because, of course, first and foremost, yes, we are researchers and we want to find out um, answers to uh, important um, questions. Of course, we're a bit more on the applied side, um, and I think that's also one of our strengths. Um, but um, uh, we are uh, experts and we want to find um, solutions and answers um, just like uh, scientists typically do. And of course, um, the collaboration interdisciplinarity with domain experts from um, those disciplines for which we then um, do the research and which we uh, are collaborating is particularly important. So uh, one could also say that first and foremost we are interdisciplinary um, scientists. Okay, right, I see. So Simon has something to say? 
Thank you. I guess uh, I would distinguish mainly between whether you're doing research on your own project or somebody else's. That sort of that seems to be the cleanest in my mind distinction between whether you're a service provider, external expert, um, or what you would call a researcher. Just a comment. Okay, uh, because we have. Ah uh, yes, go on. So now we come back to the question from the from the audience. Question so or comment? Questions. Questions. <laughs> okay, go ahead with your question. So mm -hmm. um, the question is I gave for the last presentation. You say that you basically help researchers understand their data, but how can a researcher not understand its data? I think that was a quite different. Um, okay, I re reformulated, yeah. but it's the same meaning. Right. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, so it, it could go in different directions. In some cases, um, they do collect lots of things, not knowing what they're going to use. So in that sense, the answer might be, I just help them by um, doing graphical analysis of their data. And, and then I can tell you, look, I see this and this in the data, does not make sense to you? And then they might discover, like this morning someone was saying, um, we found out, thing, I, I think it was you, Mikael, things that they're not yet explained. So this is, sometimes they do find explanations, sometimes they don't, but it's you um, telling them, look, do you see these patterns? Does that make sense to you? Is that this going the direction? Not. Okay, <laughs> yeah, then tell. It doesn't answer my question right. neither. It's, um, I just cannot understand why a researcher would go with a question they cannot actually look at understand their data. Otherwise, if they would make just a hypothesis and go over it, just they, are, they are going to focus on the research questions, which, for example, in my case, it will be behavioral finance, yeah. trying to understand the market. So in my case, I'll focus on data that I can un understand, I can explain. If it's not explainable, then just I'm using machine learning and do that some magic then behind it. And why, okay, this is what will be my reason. But why wouldn't you just train the researcher to better understand their data during their course? Because this is actually a mandatory rule, basically, to have a good paper and not um, something which is like coming on the top of the pyramid of being a researcher. It's actually the base of Maslow pyramid in becoming a researcher. Actually, I think you can turn this question around. And I have also a similar question. This is, you say, to what extent uh, also the researcher should understand their data, you can also say, should the researcher actually do the data science? And to what extent are these units that are sitting here, or at least some of them, are needed in the future? You know, of course, you can, you can argue the researcher needs to know the data and the researcher needs to do, know the method. The ideal case, everything in one brain. Yeah. But how do you... How, So, uh, may, 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 yes, please go ahead. Uh, maybe I can expand on this point because uh, I, I view it uh, more as a, because research and science can sometimes be a mo moving target and this expression has been used a lot today. So I have an experience, for example, with uh, one of the interactions that I have with the project proposal that we're, we're analyzing, is that sometimes data is collected for one goal and it turns out in the future that it could be potentially used for an another. And so it's in that sense also that we can help uh, researchers see what is the value in their data and how it could potentially in the future be measured a little bit different so that this new uh, goal that showed up could be uh, better explored. So to give a concrete example, uh, there was a, r a researcher in the uh, economics department in our university that approached us because he had access to this uh, huge database of uh, scans from parliamentary speeches from the UK that were collected. And they were collected for uh, record reasons. 
So for historical reasons, they want to preserve those speeches. And he, he, he came in as a, an economist, had this idea of exploring this data through a new lens of saying, okay, can we actually identify throughout those speeches how economic theories influence the way politicians speak or what they speak about in, in their, in their spe speeches? And, and so this is, in a sense, like a, a new lens that you can give to, to an old data. And yes, if you want to study that in the future, then maybe you can uh, inform uh, people who are preserving today's scripts to maybe add an, an extra metadata or, 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 or gather some extra information that would put this into highlight. Because us, uh, at this point, looking at the old data, we have to do a lot of pre-processing and extra work to actually extract this information from the data that was already gathered. So this feedback is sometimes important of informing uh, what would be useful for the analysis so that when the data is gathered uh, and when the measurements are done, you can hi highlight those things and they are easier to extract. So I have a, a similar question here. Um, how much does a data scientist need to know the domain science? What do you think? You know, to, 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 make, to make the collaboration successful or to, to bring a significant contribution to the collaboration? So I okay, guess so I think this depends on you know, project. the project. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that what is important, and I think this is a, uh, a point that you tried to, to make in your presentation, is that one critical aspect um, is to, to be able to build uh, an exchange that goes in depth, because, I mean, to connect with the previous point, what is clear is that domain scientists, of course, they have uh, a lot of knowledge about their data, which they understand in a certain way, uh, based on their field of expertise and uh, trying to understand as much as possible of how they view their data and how they view the final goal of the research that, um, uh, that they want to achieve is something that like, you know, needs to be put in common and shared as much as possible. So in some areas, for example, in a number of situations in biology, it's, uh, it requires for the data scientist uh, herself or himself to get to understand quite a bit about uh, the biology because the, you know, the level of understanding that you need before you're able to have a common language um, is, is, uh, more, uh, is more involved. But um, there are other applications where uh, you know, somehow the For instance, um, as a, you as SDSC, you have probably a good overview. Yes, so yes, so I mean an uh, application where there is less um, um, let me think so. Um, an abstraction can be made between the... Sometimes it like, you know, like a simple abstraction can be made. So, I mean, for example, we have... Uh, um, yeah, maybe like, you know, once you come specifically on, on one given project, it, it maybe sort of like more knowledge needs to be, to be understood. But for example, we have one project which is about uh, you know, trying to solve an inverse problem on diff diffraction patterns. And, I mean, of course, you need to know a bit about uh, Fourier transform and then, like, you know, understand what is the form of the problem. But there isn't such, like, uh, such an amount of, of, you know, concepts that you need to understand because the, pr the problem, you know, we work with physicists very often, the problem is, you know, already formulated in a mathematical language that is sort of, you know, make it easier to... to, to uh, to understand it. So there are these, uh, and in, uh, in fact, so if I can make comment, in at SDSC, uh, if we look at the people who work uh, in, in our collaborative projects, we typically have, you know, people who have a field where they have acquired over time more domain expertise. I mean, they're not domain experts themselves, but they have had the experience of, of working in collaboration with this domain, and those would typically be indeed in biology, um, I think in atmospheric science uh, and you know climate science, this is also the case. And then we have a number of people who have more you know technical uh, expertise that are very specific in machine learning, for example, and that are more versatile that can like you know uh, go from one problem to the other. Um, as I have the mic, I, I just want to follow up maybe on the previous point, uh, and, and you know, one aspect that I, I would like to try and clarify, which is that um, 
and it's connected. It's really that uh, there is a certain way of looking at the data that, um, of course, we want to try and transmit this and share it so that you know people who are working in a certain domain and are interested by you know using data-driven methods get to be thinking in this way. But when you have a certain experience with the various kinds of uh, problems in, in data science, then you, you have a different way of looking at the data. And maybe if I can just give an example. So we have one project which is about studying um, these, uh, what are called these uh, stratospheric warming events. Um, so those are events that happen in the stratosphere um, and which have caused, I mean, if you remember, uh, if I remember correctly, this was in 2021, like uh, there was a, a wave of very, very cold uh, weather, uh, or maybe it was 2020 now, I'm not sure. We have very, very cold weather in, in the US and like there were freezing temperatures in, in Texas and uh, in, in Europe, there was a lot of crops that were, you know, sort of under this, this, this terrible drop of temperature. So this is due to this reversal of um, winds that happens in the stratosphere, which has an impact for several weeks on the weather. Um, in, in um, below, basically, right, because the is, is above the, the troposphere. And so um, when we, we worked with um, experts of uh, atmospheric science, and of course they understand very well their data, but they understand their data in terms of, you know, pressure, fluid dynamics, and all these concepts which for us are not familiar concepts. But they wanted to be able to predict what were the characteristics of these phenomena that you know, are predictive of the, what happens the weather or how we can, you know, predict the occurrence of these phenomena. And for these, for us, there is a whole level of abstraction that becomes useful, which is to say, oh, you want to do some form of dimensionality reduction or you want to actually, uh, you know, do some sort of representation learning to extract features that are going to be useful. And this is going away from the concrete science that they are uh, expert of and using more abstract concepts from you know, just machine learning. And I, I think we put things in common. I mean, it's a different way of looking at the data. And it's not, uh, you know, assuming that uh, domain scientists don't know their data, but it's just that we bring a different way of looking at the data. And in, alone, we would not be able to do this. I mean, it, it is really something which, you know, is interdisciplinary, as what you were saying. So, awesome. Yeah, so maybe just to expand on the previous question, uh, uh, how much we should know about the domain uh, expertise. I think uh, a rather m more important skill or, or mindset to have is to be open to new concepts and, and, and being able to filter what it is it from that domain that you're actually are going to be your targets, what is it that you're going to be measured, sort of having this capacity to translate concepts from different domains rather than knowing them. So to give a specific example, we were working with the ancient civilization department on a project on uh, ancient Greek papyri, and none of our analysts know any ancient Greek or what the texts say or who the authors, authors are. We're just uh, lucky that in this partnership, the, the person has uh, annotated the data set, so in the sense that we we have a discrete set of what are the possible characters, uh, l different labels for different um, authors. So that's all that we need to know about that in order to do character recognition or author recognition, style recognition, something like that. So yeah, it's, it's more of a, a capacity to translate a concept, new concepts into what you know. Uh, yeah, so one thing I could put, maybe add is that um, from my point of view, uh, what domain knowledge gives you is a little bit of an edge in terms of um, accuracy, precision, and so on. It, and this is not always necessary. There are going to be many problems where you can basically you know, completely ignore the domain, apply some off-the-shelf method, and this will just be good enough. And that's perfect. If, if it works, that's great. But um, usually you know, a deeper understanding of the data, of the acquisition process, of how it was prepared, uh, will give you some insight which you can then exploit to, you know, maybe better optimize your machine learning model. Maybe there are going to be exceptional situations where you want to do something special rather than just applying the machine learning model. And, you know, uh, this is on a case-by-case -case basis where you have to decide whether it's worth it or not. I mean, of course, you know, that requires more effort on the part of the person doing the data processing. Okay, I... Will anybody else on this question? Otherwise, I have... 
I have many well, more. I, have, I, also, I would like to bring through five questions. So well, we have now already five o'clock. <laughs> no, but go ahead. Go ahead. Very short. Uh, you need to know enough to understand the scientific question. That's my definition. And that means also you need to go ahead and check your list of jargon and make sure it means the same to both people. A solution in biology is a liquid. To a mathematician, it's something else, right? For example. Good. I have another question. Uh, what do you think are the prerequisites for a, a successful data science collaboration? Besides the, the, the things like, you know, project management, timelines, again, charts and the milestones. Really not, I don't, I really specifically for a data science collaboration. Money. <laughs> no, money is also, I, money is also project management. This is, this is this part. Do you have any, do you think? I mean, yeah. I, I would say the, the, the right data okay. and the right amount of data and the right amount of labeled data or, or, or you know, what is crucial is to like have a very clear understanding of, you know, what is the data that is available and like uh, to try and like connect it to what you want to do with it. Because I mean, very often people have quite a bit of data and they have very interesting questions, but uh, for me, the most important thing to do first is to be able to determine whether the whether the data uh, is the right data. Is uh, enough data is also. enough data. I mean, mm -hmm. like very often there is more than enough data because uh, you know, in, in many first conversation that we have with uh, potential collaborators, uh, you know, the, there is yeah, there is terabytes of data or there is like you know many gigabytes of data. But then if you look more precisely at like you know, okay, what what is the number of effective samples? Like you know that are either labeled or or the 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 data that you could leverage to do some sort of unsupervised or semi-supervised learning, then you start actually like counting the data in a different way, and then there's always like a number of things that you don't necessarily think about is you know there can be a lot of data but maybe they haven't been acquired under like different uh, experimental conditions so like then the whole data doesn't have the same distribution, or I mean you have to think about all of this. So, I mean for me the 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 main difficulty is is to uh, really have an assessment of, you know, what is the, what the data is really in detail. And do you do that before you take a project? Yes. Now, of course, in, in, in SDSC, you have this, uh, let's say, this evaluation process, so we, you do it, I assume. We take advantage yeah. of the fact that we, we have this procedure to try and really go as far as possible. Uh, and, and we do this to try and help also, like, you know, have a diagnostic about what is possible, what could be considered. I mean, this is maybe a bit of a bias, but uh, for this reason, I tend to consider this as very as, as being key. And the others? Do you see something specific? Very short. Make sure that your collaborator is smart, motivated, and that you understand the problem yourself. Right? You should agree on what it is you try to achieve. If if those three things are there, then yeah, you'll succeed. Well, I can talk about lessons that I have learned over the projects that my team has worked on. And I believe that starting from the end, that is clarifying uh, clear expectations for the client of what is going to be possible to achieve and not. And also trying to determine a definition of done. Because this is also a question that I would be curious to hear from the others. Mm -hmm. What determines the end of a project for you? Because, you know, for uh, software, it's oftentimes easier. You have a list of requirements or the specs. And once you are feature complete, uh, maybe you can consider the project to be done. And for machine learning, data science is not quite the same thing. You may have something that is feature complete in the sense that gives you a given prediction, given a certain output. But then the metric that you're going to evaluate with is what is really key. And what I have found many times in the project that we have worked on is that scientists would keep coming back to us and saying, look, the results that you are achieving are really amazing, but uh, maybe if, you give, if we give you a bit more data, would you be able to do anything a bit better? Or like, uh, do you think that you can still improve, further improve your model? And if we don't have clear expectations on this, uh, I believe that it can become frustrating on both sides. And so I think that, yeah, trying to determine uh, very clear expectations in terms of accuracy. So something that I was mentioning in my talk was the uh, presence of uh, intrinsic noise into the data. And so the fact that achieving 100% accuracy is not even a realistic, is actually meaningless for many 
many projects. So trying to determine a baseline against which you're going to benchmark your model. And maybe you're going to say, once we reach a level of accuracy, which is comparable to the inter-rater agreement amongst humans, we shall consider the, uh, the project to be done. I mean, maybe one point I can add here is um, so how much the, the research in the end trusts the solution. So especially, so I have one example from the a project um, with a history professor. Of, um, they wanted to apply natural language processing techniques like uh, topic modeling, unsupervised methods. And um, actually, the idea came from them. So they wanted to apply it. But in the end, it never really worked out. So they showed them everything, how to use it. But um, they, they couldn't really, I don't know, for, for some reason, it didn't work out, and, and they didn't never applied it in, in the end for the, for their data. So I don't know if I can relate then your answer to mine, and I would ask you: Do you think that if uh, there was an objective metric that quantify how accurate your uh, model, uh, your topic modeling is, maybe this would have convinced more your users to use your tool, such as saying our model correctly classified the topic of the of the text in ninety five percent of the cases. I think the problem was a little bit that we were still in that exploration phase and there was not really like um, a target we could uh, identify. And for, I mean, then it's quite, uh, quite hard to, to really say how, how accurate the methods are. Um, and uh, yeah, exploration didn't work out in that case. <laughs> If I can add a comment there, I think it's much easier to define the scope uh, of a project in, you know, a supervised uh, learning task because then, you know, like you, have, you you reach a certain level of accuracy, and then like you know you see how like through different attempts that you're making at making the model more complex, you you I mean at some point yeah you don't increase anymore, uh, but it's much more challenging if you have uh, you know and there are many uh, projects I think uh, that are related to research where. There is not it's not a supervised learning task where but where you need to answer a more general scientific question, and there you know whether the tools that you develop are the right ones is I mean it's a more complex question. Yeah, I can fully subscribe to that. So we'll be doing a lot of data-driven um, projects. And um, there, I think, I I particularly if it's contract work, which is for a fixed um, amount, then the 80-20 rule helps us um, very much. As Simon also said, um, it's often good enough. So you start off with a relatively simple approach that um, solves um, everything uh, up to the end, of course, with limited accuracy and uh, show it to the customers. And often, indeed, um, customers um, want to have this um, exploration um, mainly, and then some are happy with it and some aren't. And, then, and this is much more challenging. Um, but I think the 80-20 rule um, can help us to um, achieve the goals. So I'm actually curious because I think this uh, raises an interesting question, which is uh, something that I don't always hear being mentioned, which is, I agree with you, it is important to start with a baseline, which is uh, simple enough to be tested in a quick time, and then you're going to try to beat that benchmark. But the question is, is this benchmark always machine learning based? Because for instance, like when we're talking, we're, we have a big project which is related about uh, text mining, and I oftentimes hear about super complicated solution, uh, creating knowledge graphs, uh, relation extraction, uh, named entity recognition. And I, we often wonder like, how better are these solutions with respect to simple regular expression extraction, which would take maybe, I don't know, a couple of days. So is your baseline always machine learning or do you sometimes end up also accepting, accepting let's say the null hypothesis that the state of the art non-machine learning is also good enough? Well, the regular expressions, since you mentioned them, are good enough for um, only very few things, like if you have uh, very regular patterns, I don't know, if you want to detect phone numbers, for instance, um, um, then yeah, you can really get there. But as soon as you start to have um, named entity recognition or anything slightly more complicated, um, then you can really profit from a um, more advanced um, uh, approach. So. Um, for very few tasks is uh, just a rule-based approach, let's say, um, uh, good enough in natural language um, processing. Um, but of course, often a relatively simple out-of-the-box approach, such as using mallet topic modeling or so, um, will indeed already get you to seeing the differences that are essential. So it shouldn't be overly complicated often. Okay, you, and then I have a Go ahead. 
I, I, I have one, one short this. comment, uh, which is maybe particularly relevant for longer uh, running projects and larger projects in general, which is to have a backup plan. Uh, sometimes things are not going um, as you were hoping they would. Um, and you know, if your scientific question and, and the overall goal is based on achieving 99% accuracy before you have started acquiring any data and it turns out to be impossible, what do you do, right? Like, um, hopefully there is a, a kind of strategy where you can maybe you know, walk back your ambition a little bit, or, or maybe you can boot force things, maybe you can, you know, hire people to do some manual annotation or whatever, and, and, and get to the point where uh, you, you get a productive output. And this is something you have to um, think about early on and, and plan for it. And, you know, if you're lucky, it will not be necessary, but very often it is. I have a last question for the interest of time. I cannot bring all of them, but it's the last is a little bit provocative. Do you think in the mid or long term, you guys, this kind of units are needed, are still needed, or is data science becoming so, let's say, either standard curriculum for any STEM student, you know, science, technology, engineering, math, that is just expected, or otherwise it's absorbed by companies like Google that you draw your own smartphone, you just tuck, 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 and it's done. Either or, I mean, either or, what do you think? Or do you think, no, no, this is, we are safe. I, I can maybe start with a very short comment also. Um, so I, I think we should automate away whatever we can, um, as much as we can. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think you know this knowledge of those various tools and analysis techniques and so on, this is going to be uh, more and more um, available. I, I think you, Simon, had a, had a thing in your presentation where you um, highlighted Fiji, for instance, right, as a, as a toolbox that is now used by many biologists and there was no code tools where, you know, with little knowledge of machine learning, you can, you can get useful results, and, and that's great, but that should all grow. But I think there is always going to be space for, um, uh, for what we do, um, particularly f uh, in cases where the standard tools don't work because of scale or because of complexity of the data and whatnot, and I, I don't see that going away anytime soon. Yeah, to, to complement on that, uh, there's I think there's always going to be a, a huge overhead for certain uh, types of research to to be able to be in a position where they can hire an analyst to work on their problems by themselves. So, so think of a, a, a theologian, for example, who is specializing in, in, in a certain historical period. Like for, for, for them to be able to specialize on that and also uh, uh, be knowledgeable enough on an analytics to be able to hire somebody to answer some quantitative questions it might be a bit too much to ask. So specialization is is, uh, is quite natural. And there's a reason, for example, why companies in, in industry, they rely on, on external consultants to solve some, some problems because uh, their, their experience in different projects and in different contexts brings so much value to them that it's... Uh, it's more worth it than having like a dedicated team within the company to solve the big issues. So consultancy in that in that case is 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 a very big value added, and it's it's part of what we um, we provide as a specialized center in data science or machine learning because we have so much experience. But it's, it's still not person. the same. I, I know that, of course. In in companies, you make this uh, let's say specialization, and you take the other one. But here, here we are talking about academia. You know, you, you do not, it's, it could also be that it's, yeah. that you make a collaboration, let's say, with another research group, you find somebody, but uh, these are really, some of these people here represent really separate units. This is not just another research group who, who has a data scientist, PhD student or so. Maybe just to get a perspective from from the teaching point of view, um, you, you could argue that, you know, you're going to put much more machine learning in all curriculums and anything, and then most of the work will be done by the researchers themselves. From my, my experience and what I see in, in, in my lectures, uh, many people, they're not that much interested in, in, and there is no way you can fit all what they need in a curriculum, because it would mean taking out a part and taking away many, many other things. So it's just impossible from the educational point of view. Then how you organize these units, whether any group should have a, like a data scientist or whether you have big groups or if you've got many groups this is difficult and this is like also related to many political uh, financial um, i don't think that there will be good solutions it's always like a compromise making everyone happy but um, in general I, I do think that you can automate many things like you were saying also this morning some some images and some 
tasks they can do by themselves, easy, that's okay. Um, but there will still be very many things that are difficult and you need experts. And because they, they level with race, they will still need someone more expert than them to do more complicated things. So like in terms of people doing this, I think you still need them, how they're organized, I don't know, and who knows. You already said what I wanted to say, so <laughs> I'll, I'll be short. I'll try at least. Uh, so the w the way I see it is that th it's not so much exactly what we do, but rather sort of our approach to doing it. So it's not that we're doing machine learning right now. It's going to be something else, maybe in five, ten years. So we, I mean, us in in let's call them service facilities or, or tech-heavy groups, we sort of exist in a in a in a time bubble that is maybe uh, two to ten years long between new technologies being developed and then th then them being automated enough that you just click on the green button, right? Uh, and then you pick up the new one, let's say. Always and uh, then we the pick the up the new one because it's what we do, you, right? you will become the consultant of the, the next cutting edge thing. Exactly, and that, okay. that's what we're doing, right? I mean, 10 years ago, there was no deep learning for image analysis. We did yeah. something else, right? Now there is, uh, or rather, a few years ago, uh, th it was all you had to train your own network, and now there are plugins. Right. So even that is, uh, is is finishing in some to some extent. I mean, the bread and butter version of it is finishing. There's always the edge cases that are challenging. I, I just w I actually want to confirm what Matteo was saying. I think you have to start from the curriculum perspective. And I talked a bit about sort of economics and social sciences. And so sort of economists they learn sort of economic theory, macro theory, micro theory. They learn sort of causal inference. Now they also learn machine learning, but it doesn't mean that they know how to do natural language processing. So also in, at the ETH and the political science course, w they do a lot of political scientists do a lot of natural language processing, but there is almost no time to go into detail there. So it's, and often, I mean, people, s many of the students, they start with, they become interested in a certain research question. And then later it turns out that they get the hands on this great data set, but they actually don't know how, like say a text data set, and then they, they need to tackle it, and they start to often sometimes from zero. So um, that goes also back to the question where, you know, people often have a, you know, they have a research question, they get hands on some data, and then they need to, they often not equipped to this. I mean, I did this my PhD as well. I had to learn also then some machine learning and image analysis just, and I never done this before, but that's okay. Yeah, but uh, you need, but th it's great to have the facility to have someone there who helps you with this, and that's a, uh, if in like I mean ETH has this, but not every have university has this. But if you c if it's great to have this uh, facility and someone to support this, I think. Okay, uh, um, are there questions? Yes, from the audience. Um, burning ones, provocative ones. <laughs> Thank you for yeah, your maybe overtime. I can, <laughs> maybe I can get your point, but I don't understand this. What you said about giving outside your data to some other consulting company to do research later is like me. I collected the data from Refinitiv and Bloomberg, and I went to Deloitte and I gave them data, and I got them the results and write my master thesis. Oh, I have the grade. That's about the research as well. If they cannot treat their data, and they cannot put their data, why? What is the reason they do research then? Because I was patient and I really wanted to do research in my PhD, to do PhD. And right now I'm a bit confused with this idea. I would better continue to work without stopping anymore on academic point because I will face other unfairness, I would say. And this is like, biases, which it shouldn't exist in education, I think, first. And the second one, question, uh, this was a comment just. And the other question, or question I wanted to ask, what do you do with your data? You said you collect win, win, win situation. And, and your win is data. What do you do with your data? <laughs> right, if I can try to answer your comment, which also sounded a bit like a question, if I may. Well. I can tell you a bit of my experience at Blue Brain. So first of all, I really agree with Matteo and what other people said. Uh, biologists, even if they were introduced to programming, for instance, during their curriculum, they are not necessarily interested into that. 
And even if they were interested, I would argue that there is just simply not enough time in a, in a lifetime to become an expert in everything or even to become proficient enough so that you can do several things. And this is also not how it works in most workplaces, I would say. No one is expecting that you're an expert in UI development. I don't know how many people, many, many, maybe everyone here is an expert in JavaScript and, uh, and they are also expert in C and also Python, but they are also expert in natural language processing. You just can't be an expert on all of these things. And it's not just specific to machine learning and understanding the data. So for instance, at Bluebrain Project, the computational neuroscientist have to run their simulation on some of the largest supercomputers on earth. You just can't expect them or expect me even <laughs> to become an expert in a supercomputer, high performance computing, uh, MPI. Understanding the basics and how to use those tools, yes, but developing the tools, that's just impossible. So a master project is also not representative, in my opinion, of uh, most workplaces in the sense that if they're not. So if Maybe just to answer your question, it's not that they, they end over data. I don't know, I'll, I'll try to be sure. I don't know how much time is left, but you, you know, it's just not giving data and people will do something. It's really a collaboration. So it's a, a multiplicative process. If they put 10 and we put 10 is 100. If they put one and we put 10 is 10 and the opposite. So it's, it's, it's just taking advantage of skills expertise but also skills someone is really good like we're talking about i don't know political scientist a very good political scientist if he studied mathematics maybe he was a poor mathematician and the opposite so it's just someone who's really good at something get help of someone else and they collaborate so the whole thing it's about collaboration um, that that's i think the the main point here are there other questions from the audience yeah, and maybe just to complement, it's also not a one-way street. So there's a lot of uh, knowledge transfer that happens from, from our collaboration. So it's, it's a back and forth uh, project. Ideally, once you're working on a project, you, 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 you have a potential to, to be multiplicative in, in, this, in, in, in um, spreading this knowledge as well. So at least in, in our center, we do not expect to have a person approach us or, or with the same kind of projects going on over and over again because uh, we also want, uh, let's say, knowledge uh, transfer to the community. So potentially a person who has worked with us can serve as a, as a catalyst to spread this to other people because now they, they acquire this, this, uh, this knowledge. So uh, it's, it's really the, the word here is uh, collaboration, even if it, we're talking about service providers. Um, the goal is to, like both parts are uh, gain from from the interaction. It's not like you're extracting something from somebody and cheating the system by by do making somebody else do your job. You're actually doing something together. So, so so that's where the value is. It's not in in getting the graphs, but actually in uh, in in the knowledge transfer that happens and in, in potential new avenues for analysis that might happen. Because uh, you as a domain is a specialist don't have time to to see what is it that is, is, is there in, in the jungle of possibilities to do with your data. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, everybody, especially the speakers again, for this very nice session. <laughs> thank you for your overtime, half an hour. And thanks this a lot to the organizer of this very nice event. Yes, thank you.